this video was originally recorded March 2017 at Tibet House U.S. in New York City. Tune in as Sharon Salzberg returns to Tibet House this September with Professor Thurman and Dr. Mark Epstein. To learn more, please visit TibetHouse.us. I thought, huh? So, but how wonderful to be here together, to um, be in this lovely place. Are any of you here at Tibet House for the first time? Is it? Welcome. It's really, uh, it's a wonderful facility and uh, obviously it's an art gallery and the exhibits are always changing. They're quite uh, interesting always. And for me it's interesting because it's always like presenting in a completely different environment depending on what the art is surrounding me. Tuesday nights here there are introduction to meditation classes um, that I sometimes teach, not as often as I once did, but still I do. Um, Wednesday nights, currently, there's a 17-part series going on of uh, classes inspired by, I wouldn't really say based on, uh, I don't know, as a filmmaker, you have to like, guide me in these things. Where's the line of truth? Um, uh, Dan Goleman wrote a book for and with the Dalai Lama about his vision for the world, how to live in the world and um, make for a better world. And that was called A Force for Good. And so Bob Thurman, who's, of course, the founder of Tibet House, was really inspired by that. And so he established this 17-part series, which is still going on. So you can tune into that. So. And we are starting tomorrow. I found out just now at 10 a.m. for those of you who are coming back tomorrow. I heard it said on the website and then I looked, all it said was 5 p.m. So it was a mystery. And as people started writing me, I was like, I don't know. So, but 10 a.m. is a lovely time to start, especially because I live very close by. So it is not an early morning for me. The topic tonight and tomorrow is equanimity, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, tonight we'll, we'll talk about it, we'll sit, we'll have questions, and tomorrow certainly much more extensively we'll, uh, especially in terms of practice, have, have a lot of opportunity to be looking at these things. So the word equanimity I think is kind of weird. Uh, like many words, and it actually means balance. It's not a word that perhaps is in common usage. My first meditation teacher uh, was S.N. Goenka. This was January 1971 uh, in Bodh Gaya, India. And Goenka was very, very fond of saying, be equanimous, be equanimous, be <coughs> equanimous. And we used to whisper to one another, is that a word? <laughs> Did you ever hear that word? What does that mean, be equanimous? <coughs> so in, in either form, equanimous or equanimity, it, it's kind of a strange one. I think for us, um, it tends to imply indifference, not caring, some kind of apathy, maybe that subtly sullen withdrawal <coughs> from life, a little <coughs> bit of hostility, like, eh, whatever, right? Um, but it's a very vibrant, rich, dynamic kind of balance that it implies, actually. <coughs> And even the word balance is difficult. Um, I was at a marketing meeting once. This actually is also for the Garrison Institute. Uh, we did a four-year program bringing tools of yoga and meditation to frontline workers in domestic violence shelters. And then the program itself morphed. It, it changed to 
uh, being dedicated to bringing those tools to international humanitarian aid workers. And so all the material had to be rewritten in that change. So that's why we're having a marketing meeting. And, and so I said, well, you know, it's like, it's really a dull word. And I know it's not that exciting and not, not everyone, you know, would go for it. And it's just like, it sounds so, it sounds sort of like mediocrity or something like that. But the word that, the state that we're talking about helping engender is actually a state of balance. And everybody from the marketing team started laughing at me. And they said, you know who really likes the word balance? Anyone who feels like they're out of balance. That's a lot of people. We consider that a really good word. So I know I can sound awfully apologetic for the word balance, but um, I still think it's kind of dull as a word, but not as a state. Because we do long for, we long for some peace. We long for some perspective. We long for the ability to not be so defined by present moment circumstance. And all of that is available through the, the development of the state of equanimity. So in the context of mindfulness practice, becoming more aware, seeing things more clearly, equanimity means the kind of balance that leads to wisdom. And it makes sense, right? Like if a certain emotion arises within us and as soon as it comes up we feel hostile We've been meditating for 45 years in one month how could this still be here you know I am the most abysmal failure there's not a lot of ability to learn much to get much insight about that emotion right because as soon as it comes up we're in battle we're trying to push it away at the same time, if we get completely overwhelmed by that emotion, just no space, no center, just lost in it, I'm such an angry person and I will be forever, there's also not like the right relationship to really develop much insight. So we're not talking about indifference or coldness or or passivity, but we're talking about kind of a state of not being lost in immediate reactivity so that we can take a closer look. We have a more intimate sense of connection with the things that come and go in our minds, our bodies, our lives. We're not so lost, we're not so overcome. You know, when we're lost in an immediate reaction, we even lose sight of the thing itself. It's like, who even remembers why we're so upset? Right? Because it's just something builds on something else and something else. And the superstructure gets, gets created. And so there's a lot of equanimity in mindfulness or else it's not actually mindfulness. And nowadays, of course, the word is everywhere. It could mean anything. Um, really anything. But classically, mindfulness is a quality of awareness where there is equanimity or perception of what's happening in the present moment is not distorted by bias. We're not overcome. We're not lost in old habits or habits of projection. I'm the only one who's ever felt this and ever will. we have the opportunity to have some curiosity, some interest. Do you want some chairs? We've got some chairs, okay. Great. Um, toward our experience. One of the sort of dangers, I think, about very accurate but complicated definitions of mindfulness is that it can sound so passive. It can sound so complacent. When I was practicing, when I learned to practice, 
45 years and one month ago, minus two days. Um, it was in this town called Gaia, which is the town that has grown up around the descendant of the tree they say the Buddha was sitting under when he became enlightened. So uh, it's an incredibly sacred place. And in those days, of course, it was a long time ago, it was, it was really like a little village. Um, I haven't been back in a long time, so I'm sure it's like grown immensely. But um, there was one, there was the tree, and there was this extraordinarily beautiful stupa, temple, built just near the tree. And there was like one Thai temple, there was one um, Chinese temple, there was one Tibetan temple. The, this is the center of town. There are a few chai shops and a couple of tailors. So that was town. And we were all staying and practicing in the Burmese temple, which was somewhat down the road. Also in town, right around the center, there was a, a very wealthy landowner who had an elephant. That was one of his marks of, of wealth, you know, that he had this elephant. So there we were down the road, and this would be not an uncommon question. I would hear people asking my teacher, they'd say, if I were to walk into town to get a cup of chai, and I see the elephant coming toward me on the road, should I mindfully notice that an elephant is coming toward me? <laughs> or should I get out of the way? <laughs> and they would say, get out of the way. <laughs> but I actually understood the question, because how do we define mindfulness? Mindful mean, mindfulness means accepting things the way that they are. Mindfulness means being with our experience without judging. It does sound kind of inert, right? Like, oh. There's an elephant coming toward me. Wow, interesting. Or I was teaching not too long ago somewhere, and uh, we'll do a sitting uh, in not too long. But a very common thing to do in guiding a meditation practice um, is to begin just by listening to sound. And we move from there to awareness of the body and awareness of the breath. But I'd gotten only as far as listening to sound. And somebody raised their hand and they said, what if it's the sound of the smoke alarm going off? Should I sit here mindfully knowing the smoke alarm is going off? Or should I get up? And I thought, oh my god, it's like the elephant reborn, you know? I said, I'd get up. But I completely understand that question, too, because it does sound that way. We're going to be with things without judgment. We're going to accept things the way that they are. But I think that that's obviously it's, it's a, an interpretation, and I would say a misinterpretation, of words like acceptance or a lack of judgment. It doesn't mean a lack of discernment. It doesn't mean a lack of intelligence. Um, it doesn't mean even a lack of feeling. It means the immediate kind of reactivity that takes over, that makes our actions just driven, doesn't have to really be the strongest operating force at the time. Awareness creates some space out of which we have options. We have choice. And then we can go for it, right? Whatever we feel will lead to more happiness, less suffering, more clarity, less confusion. So equanimity is that ingredient in mindfulness that allows us to have more balance. Because mindfulness doesn't just mean you know what's going on, that you hear a sound, or you taste a certain thing, or you're noticing a certain emotion. It means without judgment. <laughs> Right, because our interest is, which doesn't mean without discernment and all that, but our interest is in seeing more clearly. So if a state, for example, in the world of mindfulness, if a state like anger arises, our goal is to see more and more deeply into the heart of that anger. 
not why is it here, what am I gonna do about it, and how awful a person am I, or I need a new therapist, or I need a new meditation technique, but what is it? I had a, one of my Indian teachers came to visit once to the retreat center I co-founded in Barry Mass, the Insight Meditation Society, and, um, and I was freaked out because I was experiencing some anger and I'm sure he could tell from the tone of my voice I wasn't that pleased. Uh, I was in some state like, you know, I've been practicing for six years. This should be gone already. Um, so he said to me, the, the retreat center is this large brick building with this um, big sloping lawn down to the road, which is called Pleasant Street. So uh, my teacher was Manindra and he said, this is how you should be with your anger. He said, imagine a spaceship has landed on the front lawn and these Martians come out and they come up to you and they say, what is anger? What is anger? Not, is it right, is it wrong, get me a new therapist. I'm the <laughs> most horrible person that ever lived. But like, what is this? What is it in my body? What's the nature of it? What is the anger moving? Because when you really look, look at how much sadness is in there. Look at how much fear is in there. Look at how much grief is in there. Not necessarily those things, but something. Often, often there's a tremendous amount of helplessness in anger, which is an almost unbearable feeling for us. In Tibetan Buddhism, they say anger is that which we pick up when we feel weak, because we think it's going to make us strong. And it does give us energy. That is the strength. But look at everything else. That, just look at it. One of the characteristics of being lost in anger, and I'm not talking about feeling anger, but really being lost in it, is tunnel vision. Like if you think about, and just bring it up right now, when was the last time you were really, really angry at yourself? It's not likely to be the time when you say, you know, I said that really stupid thing at that meeting, but I did five great things, same morning. <laughs> it's like those five things, they're gone. Or options for making a difference, they're gone too. Right, everything just kind of gets squeezed down into that, that vise, so we can observe all that. Then if we want to take action, we can take action incorporating all those emotions, not just the topmost layer. We can really recognize the tremendous change, the changing nature, the transitoriness of that anger. It felt so overwhelming, so ultimately real forever, who I really am, who I will always be. But look at it. It's moving. It's an alive state. It's a system. That's a different relationship to our experience. That comes from the equanimity. And it does not lead to passivity. It leads to creative action. Because we're not so bound just in habit. Equanimity also plays a role in this other kind of um, system in, in Buddhist teaching called the four Brahma Viharas. Brahma means supreme or um, celestial. One translation I heard of it once that I liked was the word best. Vihara means dwelling or abiding or home. So these four qualities are said to form our best home. And like any home, we're not there all the time, but when we get back home, it should be the place where we feel the most ourselves, the least pretentious, the most authentic, the most relaxed, we're home, right? So the four Brahma Viharas are about making a home out of these states, wherever we are, whatever the circumstances of our lives might be. The first of these qualities is called loving kindness. Um, it means a 
profound sense of connection. The literal meaning of the word from uh, Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text, which is metta, M-E-T-T-A. The literal meaning is friendship. But friendship, I think, can sound a little gooey to us, you know, like, I really hate you, but I'm gonna make friends with you. Um, and there, there are some major controversies, I think, around understanding loving kindness and, and the other qualities as well. One is the idea that these make us weak. They bring us down. Uh, just like equanimity or mindfulness can sound so passive and so dull and um, weird, then the idea of love or loving kindness uh, compassion, which is the second of the Brahma Viharas, it can sound so gooey, sentimental. Um, you're going to lose your edge. You're not going to be able to take a stand about anything or be forceful or uh, try to protect anybody else. You're just going to be, you know, sort of loving, uh, very saccharine sort of way. My first book, the first book I wrote was called Loving Kindness. And um, I have a friend actually who told me he used to read it on the New York City subway. And he was so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness that he used to cleverly place his hand over the title so no one could see what he was reading. And I thought, oh my God, it's like pornography or something. And, and then I actually looked at that edition of the book and those are big letters. I mean, he must have like slapped his hand there. Um, you know, and I think it's such an interesting time that our idea of love has sort of degenerated. So it's not seen as a force, it's not seen as a power by and large, but something that really makes us sort of like simpering or saccharine or... Um, I say in the book, I use this example of um, an interview I read in Time or Newsweek. Um, of a former beauty queen. So this is, is Miss Kentucky. So this was like maybe 30, 40 years after her reign of glory. And they asked her, somebody asked her what she had to say about life. And she said, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of smiling. <laughs> and you think, okay, 30 or 40 years just smiling for the camera, totally meaningless, really disconnected from whatever she was actually feeling. And so that, I, I think, is something of the image that people sometimes hold around a word like loving kindness or compassion. So one of the great myths or great controversies is the idea that a quality like that will weaken us and make us kind of stupid. And the other big, big question is, or big controversy, is the idea that these qualities can be trained. I think with something like compassion, for example, we often think, oh, it's like a gift, and you either have it or you don't. And if you don't, you're out of luck. Whereas, certainly from the point of view of Buddhist psychology, absolutely it can be trained, because these qualities are felt to be emergent properties of how we pay attention. You know, you go into a store, you don't really look at the clerk, you look through them, they might as well be a piece of furniture for you. There's not the conditions there for a genuine sense of connection to arise. Whereas if you really look at them and you really listen to them and you're not just caught in assumptions about them, a very different sense of connection can and does arise. Not because you know their story, not because they've done you an enormous favor, not because you're indebted to them, but because you're paying attention in a different way, right? So we have loving kindness, which is that fundamental sense of connectedness. Doesn't mean you like everybody, doesn't actually mean you like anybody. But there's a deep, deep knowing our lives have something to do with one another. Our lives really are connected, all of us. Then the second state is compassion, um, which is defined as the trembling or the quivering of the heart 
in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's a movement of the heart and it's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. This is also in contrast to a movement into to burn up, right? It's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. So rather than being lost in denial or being afraid or being blaming or rather than having a sense of like, I am going to fix you, um, it's really a movement toward in care, in recognition of our shared vulnerability toward change, toward life. The third of the qualities the Brahma Viharas is called sympathetic joy. It means joy in the happiness of others. Uh, rather than witnessing someone's success or good fortune and falling sway to the voice, which so often arises within us, which says, ooh, I wish you had a little bit less going for you right now. <laughs> like, you don't have to lose everything, but if the light could just dim a bit, I would really be pleased by that. So in contrast to that, we actually feel happy for someone else's happiness. And what a relief that is, because their thing is not diminishing anyway. No matter how resentful you are, all that's happening is you're filled with resentment. And it's an interesting state because it's challenging. I mean, some people do have it automatically. They just seem to have it naturally and they exude it. Something really good happens for you and they're so happy for you and it's so beautiful. Whereas other people, they may smile, but you really get the feeling. <laughs> they would be just fine if it fell apart for you. And it feels so terrible. But for most of us, it's not natural. For most of us, it's actually a training. It's a training in paying attention differently. So we challenge certain assumptions. Assumptions like happiness is a limited commodity in this world. And the more someone else has, the less there's going to be for me. And assumptions like you have everything and you will forever. And I, I have nothing and I will forever. So there are several problems with that. One, of course, nothing is forever. It's also so unlikely we have absolutely nothing. We may feel that way because we're not paying attention in gratitude or appreciation to what we have, but it's very unlikely. And it's also, frankly, unlikely that you have everything, right? But we get lost in, in these states. So it's an enormous relief to actually be happy for someone else's happiness. And it's possible. And then the last of these four qualities after loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy is equanimity. So when I was first learning about this, I thought that's weird too, you know, like I could see like the emotional resonance of the first three I could see how they belong together, and I thought, what's equanimity doing in there? But even though um, in some systems of Buddhism it's talked about last the way I just did, in some it's actually talked about first, because it is the ground that supports the other three, allows them to have their full flowering in their own state, not to be distorted or, or somehow um, degraded into something else. So loving kindness is said to be a quality of generosity. It's generosity of the heart, generosity of the spirit. It's expressed often, we'll do quite a bit of this tomorrow, through in loving kindness practice a phrase, a silent phrase like, may you be happy, may you be peaceful. 
And we know from material generosity that it's possible to give a gift in all kinds of different ways, right? You can give a gift, it's a freely given gift. You can give a gift thinking, that's an incredible looking water bottle you have. You know, maybe I'll give you this and you'll give me that. <laughs> so it really is a medium of exchange. You can give a gift and it's really like, thank me, would you? Thank me again. Thank me louder. How big is my name on the plaque? Right? You can give a gift because the video camera is rolling. And you think, well, everyone's going to think I'm a tremendously generous person. You can give a gift and really think, tell me it's the best book you've ever read. It saved your life, didn't it? What do you mean, no? Um, you know, there's so many ways we can give a gift. And so, in just that way, loving kindness, which is that generosity of the spirit, can be loving kindness. It can be a freely given gift. May you be happy. Or it can become what one of my friends once called loving kindness with an edge. Like, may you be happy by, let me see, Wednesday, I think. I can give you till Wednesday. I've got a long list of people to make happy, and you may be on the top of the list now, but that is not going to last, let me tell you. So speaking of lists, here's your list of everything you need to change in order to be happy according to my idea of how you should be happy, right? That is not exactly what we would call loving kindness, but it, on the surface, it can appear the same, right? So the ability to have it be a freely given gift is based on equanimity, on balance. Not like, thank me, would you? Thank me louder. Tell me it's the best thing you've ever gotten. It's like, may you be happy. So equanimity is kind of figuring in there, which means wisdom is figuring in there. In the context of the Brahma Viharas, the meaning of equanimity is the balance born of wisdom. In the context of mindfulness, it's the balance leading to wisdom. And in this context, it's the balance that's coming from wisdom. So to say that equanimity is there in the loving kindness is like saying you're bringing wisdom in, you're bringing perspective in. You bring understanding in. That's never a bad thing, really. The same with compassion, the movement toward to see if we can be of help. We know from living a life there's nothing easier practically than moving right into that suffering and getting overwhelmed and burning out. So what do we need? We need some kind of balance. Doesn't mean coldness, doesn't mean indifference, it doesn't mean withdrawal, it means wisdom. I will do everything I can to try to help you. And the reality is this is not my universe to control. I'm not in charge of your choices. I can't make you be a certain way. Interestingly enough, in the Buddhist text, one of the examples that's used for equanimity is a parent whose child is now an adult. So there's like enormous love and compassion and sympathetic joy and there's the recognition, I can't make your decisions for you. I can't force you to take up that profession. I can't make you be a certain way. There needs to be a kind of letting go, not shoving away, but a real letting go, a spaciousness, which brings us peace. It's not like you don't have the love and you don't have the compassion and you don't have the sympathetic joy, but you also have that wisdom. So I used to read that and I used to think, boy, what nice families I must have had in the Buddhist time. Like everybody let go and they're supposed to let go and it's like, you know, all these great things are happening, but you get the feeling tone of it. 
It's not dismissing and it's not meaning you don't care, but you're bringing boundaries basically into it and wisdom to bear on this tremendous force of, of caring, of love, of compassion. And we need that. And with sympathetic joy, it's the wisdom that reminds us nothing is forever. It is so unlikely I have absolutely nothing and they have everything. Happiness actually is not a limited commodity in this world. They haven't ripped off my chance to be happy by their own success. Right? So there's wisdom necessary there for sympathetic joy to actually be able to grow. All of this means that equanimity is at play in, in these other states. Equanimity is balance. And I don't think there's ever a time when you don't want wisdom to be functioning in some way in your um, reaching out or clear seeing in your mindfulness, in the efforts you make to try to make this a better world. Equanimity is born of wisdom in this context. And the particular wisdom has a lot to do with the changing nature of things. It has a lot to do with what is called in the Buddhist teaching the Eight Vicissitudes, which we'll talk about in much more depth tomorrow. And that is pleasure and pain, and gain and loss, and praise and blame, and fame and disrepute, that these things happen. I was once um, hiking with these friends in uh, California, and we decided we were going to go in on this trail for three days. Then on the fourth day, we were going to turn around and come back out along the very same trail. So this was still the third day. And it turned out to be a day of many hours of quite <coughs> steady, unremitting downhill walking. So at one point, the person I was with and I, it was almost like, we were struck by the simultaneous realization and we both just stopped. And he turned to me and he said, in a dualistic universe, downhill can only mean one thing. <laughs> and sure enough, the next day when we turned around to come out along that same trail, it was many, many, many hours of uphill walking. So that's not to say on every level it's a dualistic universe. But on the level in which we know pleasure and pain and up and down and gain and loss, it is. And we will have both sides. There is no one who has only pleasure and no pain. No one. There is no one who receives only praise and never blame. No one. So deeply in like kind of an embodied way, knowing this gives us the opportunity to have peace and be effective, and put our heart out without being shattered, and connecting, and also being able to let go. So that's the, the nature of, of equanimity. So why don't we take a break? Yes, you can take a nap, whoever that was, um, <laughs> briefly. And then uh, we'll come back, we'll have a sitting, and we'll just have time for questions, OK? Okay, so let's sit together. I thought we could go to that kind of foundational exercise of sitting and feeling the breath. A lot of equanimity involved here. First of all, we rest our attention on the actual sensations of the breath. 
And in this system, it's just the normal natural breath. You don't have to try to make it deeper or different. And the operative word really is rest. There's some balance there. Sometimes people feel if they get like a stranglehold on the breath, their minds won't wander, and actually it'll wander more. So we find the place where the breath is strongest for us or clearest for us. We bring our attention there and we rest. And it is so unlikely that it's going to be 9,000 breaths before your mind wanders. Very, very, very unlikely. Maybe it'll be two. Maybe it'll be four. Maybe it'll be one. And then you'll be gone. Well, maybe it'll be nine, you know, and then you'll be gone. Because the conditioning of our minds is to jump to the past and jump to the future. Judgment, speculation, kind of be all over the place. And the conditioning of our minds, when we realize that, is to go out in a big wave of judgment. I'm so terrible, I'm so awful, I'm the worst meditator in this room, I'm the worst meditator that ever lived. I can't believe it, they say this stuff's worked for 2,600 years, it stopped working with me. You know, what a historical thing that is, oh my God, I'm the only one in this room that's thinking, they're not thinking, they're sitting here in bliss. They're sitting here bathed in brilliant white light or some color light, I forget the color of the light, but there's some light everyone gets, but I don't have it, they have it, I don't have it. I'm just sitting here thinking I'm so bad, I'm so terrible, and maybe they are thinking. They're thinking beautiful thoughts, however. They're thinking spiritual thoughts. They're thinking loving thoughts. I'm the only one who's sitting here thinking really stupid thoughts. You know, why am I doing that? I'm so bad, right? So. When we do that, not only have we added sometimes a considerable period of time to the distraction, but we're so exhausted, we're so demoralized. We don't really have the energy to go forward. We need to really remember our attention will wander. That's just habit. The moment after we emerge, from a fantasy, from having fallen asleep, whatever it might be, that's considered the most important moment in the whole process, because in that moment, we have the balance. We have the chance to gently let go. We have the chance to begin again with kindness toward ourselves, instead of all of that judgment. So you realize, oh, it's been quite some time since I last felt a breath. See if you can let go. Bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath. If you have to do that a billion times, it's okay. Okay, so see if you can sit comfortably. There's some balance also said to be reflected in our posture, where you want some energy in your body, so your back is straight, but not like so much that you're really stiff and uptight. You also want to be relaxed and at ease but not like so relaxed that your waist slumped over. So you find your way into what feels like a balanced posture for you. And you can close your eyes or not, however you feel most comfortable. And we can begin by listening to sound. It's a way of relaxing deep inside, having your experience come and go. Of course we like certain sounds and we don't like others. But we don't have to chase after them to hold on or push away. Let them come, let them go. It's like the sound washes through you.
and bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. Bring your attention to your hands. See if you can make the shift from the more conceptual level, like of fingers, to the world of direct sensation. Picking up pulsing, throbbing, pressure, whatever it might be. You don't have to name these things, but feel them. And bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, just the normal, natural breath, wherever it's clearest or strongest for you, the nostrils, the chest, or the abdomen. Find that place, bring your attention there, and rest. See if you can feel one breath. If you like, you can use a quiet mental notation like in, out, or rising, falling to help support the awareness of the breath, but very quiet. So your attention's really going to feeling the breath, one breath at a time. If images or sounds or sensations or emotions should come up, but they're not all that strong, if you can stay connected to the feeling of the breath, just let them flow on by. You're breathing. It's just one breath. But if something comes up really powerfully, you get lost in thought, 
spun out in a fantasy or you fall asleep, really don't worry about it. We say the most important moment in the process is the next moment after you've been gone. You practice letting go, you practice beginning again. Really, it's okay. That's the training. I think it's kind of incredible that our attention can go anywhere for however long and still we are capable of letting go and beginning again.
So do you have any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to talk about? And I know we have people on the live stream too, and I assume Rebecca will figure that out. Um, and we, I don't think we have a microphone to go around, so I'll need you to speak kind of loudly and I'll repeat um, the question to the best of my ability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the dog away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love practical questions, so thank you. Um, the question was, um, when you're sitting, is the goal not to move, like not to scratch the itch or uh, shift posture in some way? Um, and my answer is kind of in the middle. It's like, to some extent. Um, you don't really want to be moving because of restlessness or because there's a lot of that. And, and then the physical movement would tend to disrupt the deepening of the concentration. But uh, there are times when it's just smarter to move. Um, you don't want to sit in pain. You certainly don't want to damage yourself. It's good to sit as comfortably as you possibly can. And if you feel like you don't have the energy you know, to deal with some ache, uh, it's better to move and start over, right? That's one of the places where we say, okay, now I'm beginning again. Um, I, different teachers will say different things, you know, about that. My earliest teacher uh, told us not to move, like, don't move. And those sittings were like on a floor, like this floor, no zafus, no cushions. Um, and I always moved. I always, always moved. Uh, and it was interesting because what I discovered was that I actually didn't move because the pain was so bad. I would move as soon as the first little inkling of discomfort would come up because I started thinking, what's it going to feel like in five minutes? What's it going to feel like in 10 minutes? What's it going to feel like in 15 minutes? And, and I'd feel overcome and defeated and I'd give up. So. That was an important thing for me to see because that was really happening in my mind, not just sitting on a floor in India. You know, that was a big habit of my mind. So that's, seeing that habit is more important than moving or not moving. Um, so then I moved, right? Because I moved so early in the sitting, I could easily spend 45 minutes judging myself for having moved. Why'd you move? You didn't have to do that. You're always the first one to do that. You're always the only one to do that. You don't see anyone else moving, do you? You know, yesterday you sat longer, why didn't you hang in there? So the irony of that, of course, was that the disruption to my concentration from the physical movement was like 30 seconds, if that. Whereas the disruption to my concentration from just getting into all of that judgment could last 30 minutes. So it was one of the places where I really saw the power of beginning again. Okay, you moved. It's a new sitting. You know, just do that. So, but do sit comfortably. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, there is a microphone. Look at that. Whoa. Um, I guess I'm wondering Could why, you just hold it like why that? it's so difficult to really be in the present mo moment. Because I've, I've tried meditating and it's, I know it's, you know, the process of bringing yourself back is in itself part of the experience, but um, I find myself thinking it's one of the most difficult things I try to do. And I'm, I don't know, I guess I, I'm just wondering, I don't know if you can shed light on why it's so difficult. Okay, so why is it so difficult to be in the present moment? I don't know that I can shed any light on that. Um, you know, except it, it's just conditioning, you know, it's, it's training. We're trained to be distracted. We're trained to be uh, lost in the past. And they say, interestingly enough, I think this is a, a discernible pattern. Very often our minds go to the past and we go over and over and over something where we now have some regret. But we're not going over it with an eye to how to make amends or be different. We're just going over it and over it and over it and over it. So it's completely useless. Or our minds go to the future. And it is not 
I mean, sometimes it is in delightful anticipation, but I think more often it's an anxiety. You know, what if my plane to North Carolina is late? Bless you. Um, I don't know, then I'll, I'll miss the connection. And I, I don't know, how am I gonna get to Wilmington, North Carolina? It's like, if you're listening, hi. Uh, you know, like, what's gonna happen to me? It's like, you know, meanwhile, it's two weeks from now. I haven't looked at a weather report. They don't know anyway. You know, but it's just like this anxiety machine. Um, so that's habit. You know, we're strongly habituated. I really can't emphasize enough that it's not a problem if there's lots of thinking, if the thoughts are really crummy. Uh, one of the great misunderstandings about meditation is that the goal is to make your mind blank and to have no thoughts and just to kind of be there. And that's not going to happen. So that's like another case of being really, really unfair to ourselves to expect something that is impossible. But what can happen, what does happen, is that we evolve a completely different relationship to our thoughts. You know, so something may come up, it doesn't drag us away for as long. We don't get as deeply embedded. We have much more space. The ability to let go is so much more graceful, things like that. You know, that, that really does happen over time. Um, one of my early teachers, this man named Manindra, um, he kept trying to move us from why questions to what questions. You know, instead of like, why is this happening, more like, what's happening right now? What's the actual experience right now? Because as he said, and it's true, it's not that why questions are useless, but at all but it's a different perspective because the answer always implies some system, right? A belief system of some kind or an orientation, a worldview. So if you asked um, why you were having a certain amount of physical pain and you're sitting to a certain kind of therapist, they might have an answer based on that particular orientation. Um, if you ask, um, as I did, uh, a very kind of um, classical, orthodox, Asian Buddhist who said, oh, you must have tortured many small animals in a previous life, that didn't help, actually. You know, then I felt even worse. I thought, not only am I in pain, but I'm like a horrible person. And I like tortured animals in a previous life, you know, so. And it's not to say all belief systems are equal. You know, some are probably uh, much more accurate in terms of how things work in this universe than others. But it's still gonna evolve, involve bringing up a belief system which may not be universally held, you know? And so, uh, almost more transformative, I think, from his point of view, Meninger's point of view, was moving to like, what? What is this experience actually? What's actually happening right now? What's, what's going on? This is a related question. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the resistance to meditate? Because probably every time I've meditated, it's been satisfying. But if I think about, oh, I should meditate, I, I don't. I come up with a reason why it's not going to help or I shouldn't. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think the question was about resisting meditation. I just think it's so interesting. and. Um, I also think there's, there's a lot of self-knowledge that gets generated from just sitting and looking at the resistance. You don't have to sit in a formal posture and you don't have to put your timer on. You don't have to sit cross-legged and feel like, oh, I'm meditating now, the very thing I didn't want to do. Uh, you know, but um, just to have that kind of perspective of looking, like, what's going on? 
uh, and not judgmentally, you know, because resistance is a very interesting thing. There are a lot of, I think, things that are interesting to look at uh, because society more or less tells us we're insane for looking at them. And so we never do it, like boredom. You know, there is no one who's told in this society, how cool, sit and be bored. You know, maybe parents sometimes say that to their children, but I don't know the tone, actually. Um, you know, it's like, I've got to buy something. I better turn on the TV, you know. I've got to get out of the state of boredom. It's unbearable. But sometimes the things we do are far worse, for example, than just sitting there and feeling bored. And we miss, like, a whole amount of knowledge about what is this state. So uh, some people say boredom is lack of attention. Um, I've looked at boredom a lot, and you know, I, it's kind of interesting. It's like that mixture of resentment, like there's nothing happening, and waiting, kind of longing for something better, and sluggishness, and you know, so whatever we look at can be kind of an interesting thing, and I think resistance is just like that. There's, um, I, I think I actually ended Real Happiness, the book, with saying something like, it's kind of interesting that if someone said to any one of us, here's this thing you can do 20 minutes a day, it'll really help your friend, we do it. But if it's us, it's really, <coughs> really hard. Sometimes people, I, I don't have time. My to-do list is so, like, drastic. Or, you know, what a useless thing. It's just about me, that's selfish. Um, I have to be being productive, I have to be taking care of others, I have to be uh, whatever it is. Or it doesn't feel the way it's supposed to feel, therefore I'm not getting anything from it, or whatever it is, you know? And so, I, rather than fight it, because it ne never works, you know, if you try to do battle with the resistance, I would say first take an interest in it and see what's cooking, because it's kind of an interesting thing. And, um, I'm the kind of person who, you know, rather than try to talk yourself out of it, I'm the kind of person who tends to, for myself, rely on structure. That's why like this challenge is interesting. You know, it's like 28 days, it happens to be a leap year, but if you start tonight, then it's 24 days. Um, the last day we're having a party on the 29th, so. Um, you get, a, five to 10 minute guided meditation every day. You don't have to sit more than that. Or, you know, assuming in the absence of some structure like that, I, I say to people, what is a reasonable commitment for you? Not outrageous that you'll never be able to fulfill. Like I'm gonna sit 16 hours every day. And for how long? So. One friend, for example, said to me, I can do 10 minutes a day for a month. That's what I can do. I said, great. Maybe it's five minutes a day. And maybe that five minutes will be the very last thing you do at night because you've spent the whole day not wanting to do it, but then you do it, right? Uh, maybe it's two minutes a day, whatever it is. So my friend who said five minutes a day for a month, it was, it was sort of in the middle of her month that I read an article somewhere uh, saying that scientists said that if you, if you meditate for 10 minutes a day for two months, you'll change your brain. So then I called her and I said, <laughs> I think you might have to extend a month <laughs> just to fulfill that. But whatever it is for you, you know, it shouldn't be unreasonable and shouldn't feel like something grim. That is one way of, of just saying, I'm not gonna argue with myself, I'm not gonna do battle with it, I'm just gonna do it for this limited period of time. And see if you wanna renew it or not. And part of that decision is certainly looking to see if it's had any effect on you. And part of that is remembering to look at your life rather than at the formal, say 10 minutes a day, as the guidepost for whether you're getting any benefit or not. It may not feel that different at all at the end. It's also always changing, right? So maybe the last meditation you do after 28 days, you happen to be really sleepy and you're sort of in a bad mood. 
it's easy to think, well, nothing happened, you know. But if you look at your life and how you speak to yourself when you have made a mistake or how you meet a stranger or whatever it is, you'll see the difference. And then you can decide, do I want to keep going with this? So that's the way I try to work with it because it just helps me. Um, I've never seen really the fruitfulness of arguing, trying to argue myself out of something. Yeah, uh, she's a microphone. Yeah, it's for the. Well, you know, I started meditating two weeks ago because I'm a clairvoyant psychic. So I noticed that the more that I meditate, the more my signals I pick up different channels and everything of what's going on in my surroundings. And then I'm able to talk to people about the situation. Have you ever had to deal with someone that was psychic, was doing meditation? Um, I'm sure, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, there's two things, you know. One is, um, uh, well, it's two things coming together in a kind of balance. Yes, I think people get more sensitive because we do clear the decks of a lot of noise, basically, you know. Uh, it's one of the reasons, and you don't have to feel you are already a psychic, you know, which in contrast to, to what you said, but anybody, you know, will find they're getting more sensitive. Like, it's one of the interesting things about being on retreat, um, where if it's an intensive silent retreat, because we don't have the normal information, you know, I live in Manhattan, I live in New Jersey, you know, or whatever, you're just together and practicing and, and people, you start to feel people uh, in a whole other way, which I find just fascinating. Like a lot of times when people are thinking about going on a retreat, it's the silence that's the most frightening thing. Like people come and say, um, I don't know if I can be silent for three days or seven days or whatever it is, or my partner doesn't think I can be silent. One person showed up once and said, they're doing a bedding pool in my office because they don't think I can be silent. But almost always at the end, people point to it as having been a beautiful part of the experience, just because of that sort of sense of connection, sensitivity. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is equanimity, which has to do with balance and boundaries. You know, like being able to stay grounded, um, not feeling overwhelmed by the energy uh, however you're picking it up, that may be coming your way. And that also deepens and develops, and we want both. You know, so uh, both, I think, really do um, get stronger, and we want them both, not just part of it, because uh, it just tends to be too overwhelming. question is about the breath. Breath. Um, so when I meditate, I know you always say you don't have to make it anything. It's your normal natural breathing. But when I focus on my breath, it's, I, it automatically gets slower. And it feels better. And I'm sure it calms me. So is that OK? It's yeah. That's okay. Uh, the, the point about it being the normal natural breath uh, doesn't, it's not meant to negate the fact that the breath is affected as we pay attention. Certainly as our minds get quieter, the breath will slow down, all that stuff. But it's, it's more the thought, it's the concept like, my breath isn't deep enough, I'm bad, you know, I'm a bad breather. Um, you know, because it's just taking that normal way of judging and putting it on the breath, which is meant to be a sort of neutral object. So in, in developing concentration, for example, or uh, that part of meditation, the usual way of doing it, or the classical way of doing it, is choosing an object of awareness, resting your attention there, when your mind wanders, bringing it back. It doesn't have to be the breath. And here you have some of the many, many methods of meditation. It could be an image, sound, visualization, mantra, prayer. 
something happening in your body. It could be loving kindness, which we'll do tomorrow. Um, often something like the breath is chosen as what we call the primary object, at least for part of one's practice, even if you're doing other things uh, at other times. And that, as my early teachers would say, uh, first of all, you don't have to believe anything in order to feel your breath. You don't have to call yourself a Buddhist or Hindu or reject anything else. If you're breathing, you can be meditating. Then as one teacher went on to say, I've always felt very charmingly, uh, he said the breath is very portable. So if you're practicing 10 minutes a day and you're using the breath as the vehicle to return to yourself and return to the moment, then you're at work or you're commuting and it's like completely frenzied and people are freaking out all around you and you're starting to get really anxious, you have your breath. You don't have to open up a closet door and pull out all this equipment, sit down cross-legged on the floor and look weird, right? Nobody even has to know you're doing it. You can center yourself, you come back to yourself through the mechanism of the breath. And, and it's very much available for us, right? The third reason the breath is often chosen after its universality and its portability um, is that it's said to be a neutral object, a fairly neutral object. So there's so many things that will come up in the course of the meditative practice that are exhilarating, glorious, and beautiful, and wonderful, and so many things that are challenging and difficult to look at. Then we have the breath where we can just chill, right? So the breath is the place where we recalibrate. We recall what it feels like to just be with. So the breath isn't neutral for everybody. Uh, physical reasons, emotional reasons, whatever that might be, and that's fine. Then we just choose something else. Um, ideally, it's something that will also be portable. You know, so if you're at work or you know you're in the airport or, or whatever. Um, it's fine. So uh, inevitably the breath will alter as we pay attention to it. Inevitably the breath will alter as our mind changes, but it's not that intentional like, oh my God, you know, I think you're supposed to breathe like to this depth and you know, I think your breath is supposed to be like count of four in and a count of eight out, and I can't do that. That's a whole system of pranayama, which is wonderful, you know, but it's not this. Mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, you have the microphone? Okay, there, <laughs> Charlotte in the back. Um, I guess I'm wondering about how to distinguish between sort of skillful self-discipline and not skillful self-discipline. So the example I have in my mind is the other day I was, uh, I meditate every day and I'm very rigid in my life and I sometimes feel like my meditation practice becomes like yet another thing that I hate on myself about, ironically. Um, and I was feeling kind of ill, like I was coming down with something and I really didn't want to meditate. I just wanted to lie in bed and watch stupid TV. Um, and so I found myself like ping-ponging in my head, like, should I meditate? Well, like, if you don't meditate, you're going to feel like shit about yourself. And, you know, I kind of kept going back and forth about it. And I kind of worked myself into a froth about like, which would be the best thing to do vis-a-vis -vis self discipline. So that's my question. Okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's good to be alive and have fun, you know. There's nothing wrong uh, with watching stupid TV, but um, the way we know is by paying attention, because you can hear the quality of how you're speaking to yourself. Uh, and the whole idea is a kind of balance. So if you were working very directly with a teacher. I mean, I know times when teachers have said, don't meditate for a while. You know, give it up. Because they sensed that the student was going through whatever. And uh, that doesn't mean you can't ever be mindful throughout the day. It sneaks up on you, you know, or 
or whatever, but um, that would be their advice. You're too tight, you know. You're not actually meditating when you're sitting down to meditate. You're sitting down and judging. So just give it up for a while. Um, it's like the whole idea of right effort. Um, in the you know, famous story of the Buddha who's working with a monk who, uh, before he'd become a monk, he played a lute, you know, and so a stringed instrument. So, and apparently this guy was like a tyrant toward himself and he was just like trying and trying and trying in the meditation. So the, the Buddha came up to him and said, oh, monk, you know, back when you were a lute player, what happened if you tied the string too tight? And the, um, the monk said, well, it made the wrong sound. And the Buddha said, well, what happened if you tie the string too loose? And he said it would make the wrong sound. So he said, just so, you know, you have to like tie the string of your effort. But that means we're going back and forth, right? We're going from one extreme to the other. We realize, that, oh, let me do that. Let me do that. Um, if I were you, or if you called me, you know, like as you were lying there fretting, I'd say meditate. Meditate for 10 minutes, and then it's done. You don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> you watch stupid TV for the rest of the day. Um, because it's also not bad to get out of the kind of form. You know, I've got to sit in a certain way, or I need my blanket and my cushion and my cup of tea and my insight timer and my, you know, incense and and I was just thinking when you started saying you know you're you're not feeling well and I thought about my one period of my practice in Burma when I was really sick I was so sick I couldn't walk couldn't do walking meditation couldn't even really sit I just had to lie there and so my practice looked nothing like you know the kind of pristine yogi look but it was actually tremendous practice around equanimity because I felt so crummy. I couldn't, I didn't have enough energy to really have like sharp concentration, but I could work with making space for how I was actually feeling. And so I look back at that period and I thought that was not useless at all. You know, that was, that was a really good practice. So. so you didn't even have to go to Burma to do that. So someone spoke before about being present and, um, you know, I think many of us work or live in a way where we have to plan ahead. Um, you know, you can't just say, oh, you know, stuff will happen and <laughs> everything will work out and, and, you know, yes, we don't have control, but we're still in this mode of planning. Um, so how do you actually reconcile those two things? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, planning is, is a way of thinking that's happening right in this moment. So you just do it consciously. I, I'm going to have you guess. I was um, looking at my calendar before I came over here because I was getting a number of requests to do retreats or, or uh, travel or something like that. So I want you to guess at the furthest out date I just made a booking for. Hmm? No? Not that bad. <laughs> you can do a month in a year. Louder? Okay, I'll just tell you because it's just torturing. It's September 2017. I just booked something. So, and people think, you know, they laugh at me as they should. You know, you're supposed to live in the present moment. Like, <laughs> how do you know? And of course I don't know, but I have to make the plan because they wanted me to come in June of 2017, but I'm already booked. <laughs> so, uh, poor Rebecca, <laughs> she's dying over there. <laughs> when are you coming back to Tibet House? Um, you know, so 
of course we plan. I mean, that's, that's the nature of how we live. There's a very big difference between kind of a useful way of planning and being lost in the kind of rumination that I was, I was talking about before. Bless you, you know, what if my plane is late? And then I'm gonna, you know, what if my plane back is late? And we have a party for the end of the challenge and the 29th and, you know, like I'm gonna be the only one not at the party and what are they gonna think of me? And, you know, here I am stuck in, you know, Raleigh, North Carolina and like there's an ice storm and there's you know, I'm gonna be there for like the rest of my life probably, you know, and like, I don't know, I have to change residency and how am I gonna vote? You know, like, that's more the problem. Of course, you know, booking is booking and planning is planning and hopefully we're kind of clear headed and strategic about it, and not so overwrought, you know, by, by uh, all of that speculation. Somebody did ask me to book for 2018, and I, can't, I couldn't bear it. So I just can't do it. Yeah, last question. Um, I just wanted to add that possibly in the middle of the meditation, if you do think of a future thing, you do have the opportunity to like stop, open your cell phone, and open your calendar, which maybe you don't do. So then you just let the you know that you'll be able to do it in 10 minutes or 15 and all of a sudden that thought just because you know you can do it so that's like one step better than stopping the meditation opening your phone and getting back to the meditation but i did want to uh, say that i had a lot of difficulty sitting and meditating until i discovered kundalini yoga and then i learned to experience the amazing feeling of meditating and feeling that all everything was in place and breath and I was breathing and conscious so the and now after a few years of doing it I could just probably I can get right into it it's best I find if I do move and stretch my body a little bit before and nobody's really mentioned that that if you do move, run in place, do some cat-cow, something, then when you sit, it's much easier, I think, but mm -hmm. I haven't done it the other way where you just go right into meditation. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, in some schools, of course, you know, and uh, their whole systems of yoga in Tibet, for example, you know, which are, and Hatha yoga itself in India has a lot to do with kind of preparing the energy, the subtle body, the energy systems of the body, not let alone the actual physical body for sitting. Uh, in Burma, they, they more would have like an alternation between walking meditation or some kind of movement meditation and sitting meditation. But, you know, you, you absolutely have to honor your own experience. And, and uh, I think it's great to experiment with lots of different ways because then we know you know, really for ourselves, at least for now, what seems to be the best thing. So that's terrific. I also say sometimes this, I was somewhere, I think Ireland, uh, or France actually, I was in France, and I said, uh, the Burmese are kind of like the schlumpy school of meditation. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like, even the Buddha statues are a little bit slumped over, you know, they're not like, Zen practitioner, you know, really amazing looking. And I went back the next year and, and uh, somebody said to me, remember when you said the Burmese are the slumping school of meditation? And I thought, didn't I say schlumpy? You know, like, <laughs> like quite, but same thing. You know, so people do treat that kind of differently. Okay, we need to stop. I'll see some of you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Okay, great. Thank you. Take care. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit TibetHouse.us. Thanks for watching. Tashi Delek.